Hey, hi, everybody. Um, I have to apologize. I think if you see my name, it says Adley D. That's my son's name. My children are home all the time. They're doing their school from home and they have taken over my Zoom. Uh, and I'm on my phone, so I can't change my name. But I'm Lena and my son is Adley. So sorry for the confusion. And uh, for those of you who don't know, Nadia is my first cousin. So I've known her since I was born, since she's my older cousin. So I won't give away our ages, Nadia, but um, she's my she's like my my big sister cousin. So thank you, Nadia. It's always a pleasure to collaborate with family, and it's really exciting just to see so many people from all over the world. This is my second time doing this webinar with Nadia, and the first one we we did, as somebody mentioned previously, on narcissism, and today. We are going to be talking about trauma as it shows up in our relationships. And I am a licensed psychotherapist, and I am also what we call an Imago certified psychotherapist. And I will get into Imago a little bit later, but it is a theory and a specialized training, not just with couples for couples therapy, but with individuals as well. And it's basically a a theory and a way of working with people who I believe have uh, unresolved trauma, and I believe almost all of us do. And so a big focus of today is actually going to be something called relational trauma. But before we get into that, I'll just give a quick overview on trauma because I think we've all heard of it and we all sort of associate it with PTSD, which is called post-traumatic stress disorder. And uh, while some of us may have experienced symptoms like that, we are actually, that's, that's not really what we're going to be talking about today. But PTSD is if you've had a deeply distressing or disturbing event happen to you and then it overwhelms your ability to cope and it causes feelings of helplessness, uh, diminishes your sense of self, it really feels like a loss of control. And you may experience symptoms like nightmares, flashbacks, and all kinds of things that sort of leave you feeling unsafe in the world. And I think the best explanation that I ever heard about trauma in general, and trauma can be anything, it really can just be an experience, and it doesn't matter what kind of an experience it is, but an experience that made you feel unsafe in the world or that the world is not a trustworthy place. And so how that manifests is it always manifests in our body. There's a really famous book called The Body Keeps the Score. And so trauma is not really a cognitive thing. It's sort of stored in our bodies. And we're going to talk about a little bit later about how this manifests in our bodies. And there's three types of, of trauma associated with PTSD. We have acute trauma, which is a one-time event. And then we have chronic trauma, which can be related to some people's relational trauma later in life. If you had a, a childhood where you were neglected or had any type of abuse, which could be emotional abuse or physical abuse, chronic trauma is repeated trauma over and over and over again. And then we have complex trauma, which you can think of as somebody who has to live in a war zone, for example, where there's exposure to multiple traumatic events. So those are, that's a basic crash course on trauma, but we're gonna shift today to trauma-informed work and relational trauma. And so when I say trauma-informed, what I mean is that we wanna shift as therapists to looking at people as what's wrong with you. And instead we wanna ask the question, what happened to you? Because everybody, there's nothing wrong with any of us. What's, what's, we've all experienced what in Imago we call wounding. If you're an adult, somewhere along the way, something happened to you that shook your trust in people or the world or made you feel that the world is not a fully safe place. And so when we're looking at things through a trauma-informed lens, we really want to understand what's happened to you in your life and in your childhood and beyond that you know, is affecting the way you're showing up in the world and it's affecting the way you are behaving in your relationships or the types of people you may be attracting as well. So that is my perspective and how I view everything when I'm working with people or just 
in any circumstance when I'm with people, I'm always looking at it as we're all reacting to things that have happened to us. And so relational trauma, that can be a response to divorce. It can be a response to the death of a loved one. That can, you know, these things can be proud, profoundly traumatic. Uh, there's a famous saying called, that, sa that says the three hardest things in life are death, divorce, and moving, with divorce being the hardest of the three. So divorce is seen by many as an extremely traumatic event. Uh, it says, as I said, death of a loved one. You can even look at relational trauma as being caused by betrayal of a friend, betrayal of somebody who was close to you. You can look at relational trauma as again, feeling neglected in childhood, feeling invisible in childhood, abuse in childhood. Maybe you were constantly criticized by a parent, felt invisible, never felt good enough. Relational trauma can come from bullying. That can happen to you, you know, from your peers. A sibling could have bullied you. Again, the bullying experience makes you feel like you're not safe in the world. And so those are a few of examples of how relational trauma can, can be caused. And so when we're thinking about how relational trauma shows up and we're looking back at the definition I gave where trauma makes you feel unsafe or that you can't trust people, relational trauma makes you feel like unsafe in relationships or distrustful of people. And, you know, it could even be with somebody that you're in a relationship with on a, su a subconscious level, you may feel like you can't fully trust them. And some of the ways that um, the relational trauma may show up, uh, especially if it's from childhood, is being hyper vigilant and monitoring people's feelings around you. And so that might look like, you know, you get an email from somebody and you interpret the email as being hostile towards you and you get really upset. You think, is that person mad at me? Did I do something wrong? And you may have this sort of pervasive feeling about different people in your life where you're constantly worried if they're mad at you or they're upset with you or constantly have a running commentary in your head that what did I do wrong? Um, that, that type of thing that happens is a result of relational trauma. Uh, taking responsibility for other people's emotional well-being is another response to relational trauma. A lot of times, especially in childhood, when a, a child or a child's needs weren't met or the, the parent took all the needs, uh, the child starts to learn that they have to take responsibility for everybody's emotions around them. And so that means that we constantly have to worry about are people happy, are they not happy, uh, making others comfortable at the expense of ourselves. We may feel very, like we may try really, really hard to be independent if we've had relational trauma and we feel it's hard to trust others. We may have the idea in our head, well, I don't need anybody else. I'm self-sufficient. We may convince ourselves that we don't need other people or we try to do everything on our own or it's very hard for us to ask for help from other people. I think that's a very common way relational trauma manifests, at least with a lot of the clients that I've seen in my practice. Uh, fear of failure is another one where the relational trauma shows up and fear of abandonment. That's a really big one. So a lot of people, you know, in past relationships, they may have had some, you know, an example could be they were dating somebody and that person left them for somebody else or left them even for a friend of theirs. And then, or they were dumped, you know, you have the, the show Sex in the City. I think there was an episode where Carrie Bradshaw was dumped with a post-it note. And, um, you know, that can be like the rug is pulled out from under you and creates a sense of distrust if somebody breaks up with you or ends a relationship out of the blue and you couldn't see it coming. Or if you've had just repeated people leave you in your life, um, that results in a fear of abandonment. And again, this sort of hypervigilance in all your relationships, that's, you know, just this fear that somebody is always going to leave you and you may feel underneath, you know, that you are unworthy or, or unlovable. And that is a deep fear underneath a lot of the relational trauma. We also have something called trauma bonding, which some of you may have heard of. And trauma bonding is um, 
you know, if we're thinking at it in childhood, at least, it's an attachment bond that a child creates um, because of repeated abusive or traumatic experiences with a caregiver. So those experiences become internalized and because the child relies on the parents to, for survival and to meet their needs, uh, they internalize that and go over, you know, overboard with trying to meet other people's needs in order to get love and approval. And this can also show up as attracting partners later in life who, you know, you're all constantly trying to get their love and approval and they may feel rejecting, they may feel cold, um, they may, you know, be roller coaster up and down walking on eggshells around them. Uh, in adulthood, you know, you can, again, the trauma bonding can be that you are very attached to somebody who doesn't treat you very well and constantly um, trying to just get their love, love and approval or believing that that person loves you even though they treat you poorly and having a very hard time at detaching from that person. So that's uh, a little bit about relational trauma. Uh, one thing before I get into Imago therapy that I, a lot of my clients find really interesting about trauma is something that we call the 90-10 reaction. And so a 90-10 is when we have something that somebody says to us, for example, in the present moment, and we feel an overwhelming reaction to it. Like we feel either more angry than we feel like we should, or really emotional, really upset. And it could just be one comment that somebody says. So a 90-10 means that 10% of what you're reacting to is something in the moment, while 90% is a flooding of all your past traumas that you're reminded of. So uh, one of the examples that's an extreme example that I had read about in a book about the 90-10 was a, a young woman was walking down the street in the fall. In the fall here in the States, at least, we have these beautiful colors of the leaves, orange, brown, green. And it had been raining and this woman was walking and she was walking on a brick street and she looked down and she saw a autumn leaf plastered to the brick pavement by some rain and she passed out and disassociated from herself and had an extreme response just to see the leaf so the leaf was the 10 the extreme response was the 90 and when she was in therapy later on and she was discussing this with her therapist she discovered and she made the connection that she had been raped before. And while, while she was being raped, it was on a fall day outside while she was staring at a fall leaf plastered to the ground. So we look at the leaf as the 10 and that overwhelming response as the 90. And so on a much lesser scale, when I'm working with couples, for example, and they really react strongly or feel very defensive against something their partner said, I speak to them a lot about 90-10 and say, you know, 10% of it is what your partner just said and 90% of it is all this other stuff. And a lot of the time that's, that stuff is coming from our childhood wounding. And so then that's gonna bring us now to Imago, which is what I do. And Imago in Latin is translated to the image of and what that means. And again, when I explain to people what Imago is, I tell you to take what makes sense and then throw, and if it doesn't make sense, don't worry about it. It's not, you know, a hard science. You don't have to buy into it. But if there's parts of it that make sense to you, then, you know, try that on and, and take that with you. And so the Imago theory says that we are subconsciously drawn to romantic partners based on our unmet needs from childhood. So what that means is that every, every person on this earth has something that we call wounding or early wounding. And that means that we can't go through life unscathed. At some point in our life, we are going to get hurt and we are going to get wounded. And I think as a parent, that's one of the hardest parts about having children is knowing that you, know, you can't protect them and keep them in this glass cage that they're going, you, you know, maybe I'm going to wound them because I'm not a perfect human. Or 
they're going to go out into the world and they're going to get hurt and they're going to be relationally hurt. And that's just a fact of life. So no matter how, how good of parents we are, or no matter how good our parents tried to be, none of us are going to come out unscathed relationally. And so all of us have what we call unmet needs from childhood. Again, they could come from a parent. They could come from a grandparent. They could come from being bullied when you were in school. There's different ways to look at it. Uh, but I'll just give some examples of a common, a common unmet need from childhood that I see with a lot of the people that I work with in my practice. And again, a lot of the time, it's more with you know a parent sort of on the, the narcissistic spectrum of this, the scale where the parent is just very involved in themselves and the child never has space to have their own feelings. The parent will take up all the feelings and the child will often have to console the parent. And so in those situations, the unmet needs from that child would be, you know, not having the space to develop their own feelings or to have their feelings and needs met. And so in Imago, as that would manifest as we get older, is that person would subconsciously be looking to heal those wounds through a romantic partner. And so Imago would say that subconsciously we're sort of looking for these people who not only can trigger our unmet needs from childhood, but also represent some of the better qualities of our primary caregivers. So it's kind of a mix of the best and the worst, I think, of our primary caregivers. And what we're subconsciously trying to do is heal those wounds and heal those unmet needs through our partner. But we all know that all humans are imperfect and that usually that partner is triggering a little bit. So if, you know, for example, you felt your father was in, you know, wasn't around a lot, or you felt abandoned by your father or not seen by your father, you know, you may be drawn to someone who's a little bit emotionally unavailable. And even though they may not be the same person as your father, if they withdraw in an argument or become silent, that may remind you of those feelings of feeling ignored or invisible by your father in childhood. And that can relate to the 90-10 that I just talked about as well. And so we have these couples coming into a power struggle because they're both seeking from the other person to heal these wounds and these unmet needs. And when that person doesn't fulfill that for them, we get very disappointed and we feel like, well, I thought this person was the one. I thought this person could make me whole again. And now, now I just feel alone. And this happens with a lot of long-term relationships and it's completely normal and it's completely okay. And what we do in Imago is we seek to sort of bring awareness to people about what they're seeking from someone else and we help them work with their partners to try to stretch outside their comfort zone and to try to meet some of those unmet needs by communicating better by empathizing better and there's a lot of different um, techniques we use to use that process to connect but one of the things that hinders us from connecting with other people is what we call reptilian brain in Imago. And this is the most primitive part of our brain, like you think about the old brain, the reptile, that is always in survival mode. And so when our reptilian brain is triggered, and again, that's something that might make us feel unsafe. And in this case, I'm talking about emotionally unsafe. The reptilian brain will go off. And then we get into a place where we're very emotional, we're protecting ourselves, we're defensive, and we can't really connect with another person. And in Imago, we also might call that two people in a relationship we call hailstorms and turtles. And it's two different types of energy that people bring to a relationship. A hailstorm, you can think of as sort of this really big energy hailing down, and that's one person. And so when their reptilian brain is triggered, their energy is to get really big and to want to engage and to want to sort of hail all over the other person. The other person usually is a turtle, and a turtle, the way they react to uh, feeling threatened, their reptilian brain, when that feels threatened, they, as you can imagine from the image, the turtle goes into its shell. Now, it, just because you're a turtle doesn't mean that you're not 
mean or angry, we have the snapping turtle too, because a lot of people think turtle is passive. A turtle doesn't have to be passive. A turtle we, could be a snapping turtle. So even though the turtle responds to threat in the reptilian brain by going into its shell, it can also come out of the shell and snap and say really mean cutting things to the hailstorm. And the hailstorm's just trying to connect by just repeatedly trying to engage the turtle. The turtle just keeps going into the shell because the hailstorm feels really threatening. Eventually the hailstorm will stop hailing, they'll give up and they'll retreat as well. And that's sort of when we have disconnection between people. And so we work with hailstorms and turtles. We, you know, we urge the help the turtle feel safe enough to come out of the shell, help the hailstorm to hail a little bit less so both people feel safe. Um, so that's one of the things that we do. And um, I can share a little bit about what we do in Imago very briefly, because I think that's connected to the beginnings of healing our relational trauma and what we do with people. And this is conflict resolution as well. You, you know, you can use this with just the good things outside of a relationship. It's basic conflict resolution skills. You can use it with a family member. You can use it with a coworker. You can use it, you know, with uh, people at war with each other in dialogue. And it's a three-step dialogical process where we have the two people sit face to face, and the therapist is sort of on the outside, like Switzerland. I think we have some some people here might be from Switzerland today, um, and the Switzerland, you know, being neutral. And so the guide never takes a side with either person because once one person feels, you know, is what we call the identified patient. If one person feels like the problem, they're not going to feel safe and they're not going to engage. So it's very important that the mediator, the therapist remains in the Switzerland position on the outside while the two people in, engaged in the conflict are facing each other. And we start with a dialogue where only one person gets to talk. And they're taught to speak to other people in a way that isn't critical of the other person. So it's a way to talk about my experience and my feelings. And so we were frustrated by instead of an you know, insult to the person. So what that would look like is I got frustrated when you slammed the door and walked out of the house. And so what that does, it's not criticizing the other person. It's, take, it's just saying there was this event that happened and I was frustrated by it. And the other person simply has to mirror back what was said. And they can't put their interpretation on it because the point of the mirroring is to stay with the other person's experience and to give them the undivided attention and to really listen to what the other person is saying. And that also helps create empathy. So the person who is mirroring would say, okay, what I heard you say was that you got frustrated when I slammed the door and walked out of the house. Did I get that? Is that right? The other person would continue. Yes, and I felt abandoned, neglected, whatever. Then the person mirroring would say, and then you felt abandoned and neglected. And then the story I make up about you is, that's one that I use all the time with people because constantly we have a narrative in our heads, a story we are making up about what we think the other person is thinking or doing. Um, you know, so the story I make up is that you don't care about me or my feelings. And so, you know, we sort of continue with that and then we switch and then we get the other person's perspective. And so the very first step is just being able to mirror somebody else without defensiveness or reactivity. And then the second step is what we call validation. And validation means that we, we don't have to agree with somebody else. You know, most of the time we're not going to fully agree with the people around us. But what we wanna do is step into their world and try to understand their perspective and make sense as to why they think or feel the way they do. And again, we don't have to agree with, you know, how they think or how they feel or what they're doing, but we can make sense of it. And a validation may be say, you know, it makes sense that you slammed the door because you had a really bad day at work and you had so much stress and, you know, it built up and, and it makes sense why you would have just you know, let out your energy that way. And then another um, 
step in the dialogue is empathy, which again is continuing to cross the bridge into another person's world and not only try to make sense of their perspective, but to also try to understand how they might be feeling. And every human being has a deep need to feel heard, to feel understood, to feel loved, to, to feel valued, to feel that their perspective and their feelings matter. And it's really, really powerful, especially when working with couples, to really watch them or families to cross the bridge into the other world and just say, you know, you must have felt really, really defeated or really, really sad when that happens and uh, when that happened. And just being able to put themselves in the other person's position and really try to feel what they must have felt. So that is, you know, the very short version of something what a dialogue would look like when we're doing relational healing with people. And also part of what comes into that is, again, is the people understanding what their unmet childhood needs are. So in the beginning of working with anybody, I try to help them establish what they're seeking to get from other people subconsciously, what they're seeking to heal within themselves. So, you know, one question you all might want to ask yourselves today, and you don't have to know the answer now, but something to process as we go forward today, is what are the things that I'm seeking in other people? And what unmet needs do I have, you know, from, could be from childhood, it could be from something else. But just what am I seeking to get healed within myself? And, and, and am I seeking that in other people? And sort of once we kind of understand what that is, and maybe we can even connect it again to, hey, I didn't get that from my mother. I didn't get that from my father. I didn't get that from my grandfather. And now I'm seeking to get that with someone else. Um, that's just a good first step in realizing sort of what we're looking to be healed within ourselves and and how we're approaching trying to get that from other people, whether we're a hailstorm or a turtle. Um, the book by Harville Hendricks, who's the founder of Imago called Getting the Love You Want, is basically just we're all trying to get love. And a lot of the times we're going about it in ways that are destructive. So we have to learn how to get what we want from people in a way that's loving and, and healthy and, and to receive that love from someone else in a way that's loving and healthy. So uh, that's a little bit about Omago. And before we get to any questions, just some other things about healing. Um, you know, one of the most important things in healing any kind of trauma or any kind of childhood wounding is a strong support network and building a strong support network. And I think Internations, I, you know, seems to be one of these places that really is a support network for people, uh, for people to come together and find community. So building a strong support network with other people, especially, you know, through something like this, especially in times of COVID where people are really disconnected. And, you know, uh, someone earlier mentioned the Zoom burnout thing where we're all doing so much Zoom and, oops, sorry, and, um, it's, it's getting to be too much sometimes that you don't want to do more Zooms, but sometimes there's also something nice about being able to connect with different people all over the world. So thinking about building a support network um, and people that you trust and people that you can have community with and people that, you know, you share things in common with. If you decide, you know, to seek further help with therapy, individual therapy or group therapy is great. Um, there is something uh, called EMDR, which is a type of therapy for healing trauma, uh, especially if it's stored in the body and you're having physical reactions. It's sort of working through the trauma through a process where you're kind of clearing it from your body and also replacing old traumatic memories with new messages and new feelings that you're actually safe. And so when we have trauma, we wanna just, in the present moment, we wanna ground ourselves and say, well, I'm safe now. So something may have happened that felt unsafe to me in the past, but we really wanna to get to sort of this grounding feeling of being safe in the present. And something like EMDR, uh, there's something called neurofeedback and also something called brain spotting. 
you can Google all of those things. There's uh, practitioners all over the world who do that kind of stuff. And then Imago is a worldwide network. And so we have Imago therapists all over the world, again, that are specialized in helping people with relationships and relational trauma. And um, you can Google, it's Imago Relationships International or IRI, which is I-M-A-G-O. Imago Relationships International, and you can connect with an Imago therapist pretty much anywhere in the world. I think also now that we are in times uh, where everything is online, you may even be able to connect with a type of, you know, a, a therapist who specializes in one of these things. Maybe not from your country, but who can do video, um, video therapy. So there's all kinds of resources out there. And, um, you know, just doing some body awareness work, especially because trauma is stored in the body and so much of us experience anxiety and stress and, and it all manifests and, and can have physical implications for us. And so there's lots of body awareness techniques, you know, from meditation and deep breathing and yoga and exercise and being able to recognize the feelings in our body as they come up and being able to connect to that. This is um, some of the future of their work with um, children who are traumatized is helping children identify what they're feeling in their body. Do they feel scared? Do they feel overwhelmed? Do they feel sad? Do they feel stressed? So being able to sort of connect with our feelings when we, when we're feeling something like a 90, 10, or we're feeling unsafe or we're feeling anxious, sort of connecting with our bodies and doing some deep breathing and relaxation and just being able to label what we're feeling in that moment. So those are some of the really, you know, steps that people can take towards accessing what's happening to them, processing it and dealing with it. And so I think that's, I've talked a lot. I think that's a big crash course and everything that I wanted to say. So I think I might, now might be a good time if anybody has questions. Yeah, uh, please, if you have, thank you so much, Lena. It was very, that was great. Please, could you raise your hand if you'd like to ask a question? At the moment, there are no hands raised. Okay, uh, since no one seems to, you may unmute yourself and ask a question. Is there anyone who would like to ask a question? Uh, yes, please. Go ahead. Uh, well, I can't say how much this has resonated. <laughs> Excellent. A, from a current, well, what I was going to say current friendship. It's now an ex-friendship <laughs> from their point of view. Um, and yes, did meet someone who's... <clears throat> actually absolutely fits those criteria with myself um but i'm no no great touch with him uh, their reaction is i think we're both aspergic and we both react mm -hmm. in different ways to each other uh and they've very clearly had some kind of trauma i know they lost their father i'm not sure what, at what age uh, unfortunately i say that we're not in touch um <clears throat> i'll spare the story on that but you know how can you um these people so, feel so self-reliant and threatened if you bring up the subject even that they might have issues how can you get uh, you know open this to them and say somehow say you need help without saying you need help <laughs> mm, okay so you're you're coming from the perspective as a concerned friend yes. who wants the other person to get help yeah and probably i need something as well but that's another issue yeah well, that's, I mean, that's a good step too, is sort of reckon, self, that self-awareness of that, hey, maybe it's some, I'm projecting something as well from me, which is really important to be able to recognize that. I think, you know, people get very defensive when somebody suggests that they need to see a therapist or they need help. Uh, and, and that's something I think that sounds like you've experienced. And so, you know, I think a lot of the time, uh being just being a caring friend and just saying you know it seems like you've been going through a very hard time lately and um i want to support you in whatever way that i can is there anything that i can is there anything that i can do to support you first you know and um you know see sort of open it up and see what they say from there but i think in terms of 
you know, offering help. Sometimes you, you can, you know, maybe send them a book or something like that. But yeah, just to do it in a way that, um, or you can say, I think, I think this is probably more effective is that if you've ever had experience talking to somebody or seeking help from somebody, you know, being able to say, it really helped me when I went to a therapist and, you know, it's a totally individual decision or a personal decision, but that's something that really helped me. And so I think sometimes that, that sort of takes off the stigma because a lot of people still carry the stigma around mental health, that it's, it's weakness, you know, to seek help. And I think the, uh, as we're evolving as a people, it's really encouraging for me in my field that it's becoming less of a stigma, at least in the US and I think in Europe, um, it's becoming less of a stigma to be vulnerable and to say that we, again, we're all wounded, you know, none of us are perfect and we all have some kind of relational trauma. And I think being able to be vulnerable ourselves and saying, you know, it really helped me when I talked to somebody and it's totally cool if you don't want to, I'm not going to force you to, but it was really, really helpful when I talked to someone and I just really care about you and I want you to be happy. And, um, that's, you know, and I, and I want you to, to get the help and healing that you deserve. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. Lena, sorry, I have I have a question. Maybe. Yes, please go ahead. All right, so I just want to check. I mean, I don't know whether maybe it's valid or not, but is there a kind, especially for for the the like losing uh, someone uh, close or or I mean, family member, uh, which is the death trauma. I mean, uh, is there a kind of like time frame where you can say, okay, I can. I mean, this is the healing process. Mm -hmm. will end by time so is there a certain time frame for that uh sorry so you're talking about the death of a loved yeah. one the death yeah. of a family yeah. member yeah. yeah that's yeah we're i think that's a really important question because we're talking about grief and grief i think is very related to trauma and we don't speak about that enough that uh, grief is a type of trauma and when we lose somebody that was very very important to us you know we're grieving there's a, a famous woman who, who did end of life work and she, she described the five stages of grief, which, you know, the first stage is denial, which is when we can't really believe that it happened. Uh, the second stage is more for people who have been diagnosed. Yes, someone's at Corey said Elizabeth Kubler Ross. Yes, and Taylor. Yes. So I'm talking about Elizabeth Kubler Ross. Thank you. I didn't say her name. Yeah, she's written a lot of great books about the grieving process. Um, the second stage, this was more developed for people who were diagnosed with a terminal illness, which was called the bargaining stage. And the bargaining stage was, you know, sort of talking with God or whatever and saying, I'll be a better person if you take my illness away, you know, and sort of trying to bargain with these higher powers. Um, and then I always say that the next two stages are very interchangeable because I actually come from a background. I worked in um, cancer hospitals for many years. So I've done a lot of end of life uh, work and grieving work myself. And I find the next stages she has, depression and anger or anger, depression, there's no order for them. I think they come and go in these waves. You know, you can be really angry for a while. You can be really depressed for a while. You can have good days and then you can have a horrible day. Um, and it's sort of this roller coaster, I think, of depression and anger that can go on for a very long time. And I don't think there is an order to them, actually. And then Kubler-Ross would say that the final stage is acceptance, which I kind of have a hard time with that because I feel like when we lose somebody that's really close to us, you never actually fully get over it. And I'm, I'm not saying this to be depressing, but um, you know, you sort of look at it as you lose a piece of your heart that you can never get back. But what can happen over time, and I, and I worked with a lot of people who have lost their children to death, and you know, arguably that's the most traumatic thing a person can experience. And you know, they lose. What happens later on in life is I actually have a very close friend who lost um, at the time his first and only child to cancer at five years old, and he went, you know, into a very, very, very deep, horrible depression. 
And uh, there's actually a book, a chapter in a book written about him. Um, because I, as we talked about community building and finding a support network, um, he got divorced shortly after his child died and he was just at rock bottom. And um, he found a group of other fathers online who had also lost children. And they formed this online support group and they called themselves the Sad Dads Club. And one of them happened to be, you know, successful hedge fund manager. And he paid for everybody, organized this trip for them to all go, the sad dads, all to go to an island in the Caribbean and to just spend the week there together, grieving together. And if you can imagine what a very heartbreaking but beautiful picture of these men and they made t-shirts that said the sad dads club and they went to this house i get i get uh, always emotional talking about this because i'm speaking about a close friend of mine and having you know gone through this with him um but yeah the dads got together and they would at the house they would cry together they would get angry they would throw things at the wall you know they were able to unleash um all these emotions and they were the only other people in the world who could understand what happened to them. And I think that was probably what saved my friend. Um, and I think he would, he would say that too, especially because he was interviewed for a book about this. And shortly after that, he uh, developed a nonprofit called Solving Kids Cancer, which is still here today, raises millions of dollars for uh, rare childhood cancers. And he is, he is married again and he has a daughter. And um, you know, it's not that his life is he's not like he's healed he'll never ever heal from losing his son but he's found a way to move on in a way where he can still find meaning in his life and this is a concept we actually refer to called post-traumatic growth and the book i'm referring to that my friend is in it's called upside and um it's by jim rendon and it's about post-traumatic growth so it's about people who go through these horrible horrible traumas and there's a part of the brain um, that grows from these traumas and we adapt to them. And life is never the same again, but we learn to, to live with it. And then, you know, we may cry less, we may get angry less, we may be able to smile and find joy again, which is if you talk to a lot of people who have experienced this post-traumatic growth, they can experience joy again. They can laugh again. Um, but you know, I don't, I don't know if people ever really reach full acceptance. Of course, some do, but, um, you know, I think looking at grief is there's no timeline to it. People grieve in different ways and it takes, you know, different, different timelines for different people. And, um, yeah, someone said a form of acceptance is learning to live with the new normal. But um, I think most, the vast majority of people come to this sort of form of acceptance where they've adapted and they smile more and they, they have joy more and they, they learn to live their life again, but there's no timeline. And, um, and it's okay if you feel like you'll never get over it. It's okay if you feel like your life will never be the same. You know, that's, that's just a testament to your love for that person. Hi, would you be able to answer the questions that I just posted in the chat? Sorry. Oh, okay, sorry, it's hard for me to keep up. Let me see, I have to sorry, go back. One, one, one moment, John Robbins has his hand raised. After John Robbins uh, gets a chance to talk, I will read the questions in the chat to Dina. Obviously, she can't answer and read at the same time. John, uh, would you like to say, uh, ask Dina a question? Sure, yeah. Yeah, so first of all, thank you for the amazing presentation. It was uh, very eye-opening. Um, so I have a friend who, again, fits some of the descriptions that you mentioned, who uh, probably has gone through childhood trauma and uh, feels unsafe. And I dated her for a while. And um, so I have two questions. Number one is, it's not about her because uh, I want to understand myself more, is after we broke up, I started understanding and knowing her more and i started actually feeling more attracted to her than the past so i'm trying to figure out is it a form of trauma bonding and how do i know that and number two as you mentioned we all have childhood wounds so my second question is do we wait till we heal and we are healthier before we get into any relationship or can it happen in parallel where you are in a relationship with somebody at the same time working on yourself i'm going to answer your second question first actually 
um, I do believe it can happen in parallel. I, I don't think that we all have to wait until we're perfectly healed because that's never going to happen, right? But I think, you know, as you're healing, as you're growing, as you're learning about yourself, I think you totally can be um, in a relationship with somebody else. I think it's a very personal question that you sort of have to, again, check in with yourself. And a lot of the times this requires us really trusting ourselves, which can be very hard sometimes. Um, if we felt like we've had poor judgment in the past, it can be hard for us to trust ourselves again. But I think that sometimes we, uh, people instinctively know when they're ready to get out there again and um, instinctively know that, okay, I'm still growing. We all are. You know, I don't think the growth ever stops. And if we just waited for, uh, you know, again, to reach this, this point, um, I don't know. I think it can happen in tandem. But that being said, the caveat is I think that we do have to have some level of awareness of the baggage we bring and again what we're looking to get healed and just being aware of that i think that's the only thing we really need to do is being just being aware of what we're bringing in and how we're reacting you know there's something powerful just about being able to say oh i know i'm having a 90 10 reaction right now because i can tell you and i tell this to all my couples and all my clients i'm a couples therapist I have very extensive training. I've been at this work for a decade now. You know, postgraduate school training. I'm married. I have children. My marriage is not perfect. My marriage is a constant work in progress. I am a constant work in progress. I have a reptilian brain and I'm a specialist, right? So I think, you know, I think that is something everybody needs to realize is that, you know, we're not perfect. We're never going to be. We're always going to have conflict in our relationships to a degree. It's just about how we repair them and how we repair relies a lot upon you know, how self-aware we are and just again being able to um being able to apologize too you know just being able to say oh i you know i had a really big emotional reaction and i'm sorry um with my couples again just being able to validate each other apologize take accountability they can move past conflict really quickly so a lot of that, again, is just about self-awareness, but it's not about being a Zen Buddhist, you know, or uh, being super enlightened because we, we will always have reptilian brain. Uh, it's just human. You know, we're, we're all programmed to be in survival mode. So uh, that was the second question. Uh, the first question was about uh, being more attracted to somebody when they push you away. Is that the... That could be, now that you mentioned it, that is possible that I got attracted when I was pushed away. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, it's a long story, but so the point is, how do you recognize whether it's a trauma bonding and is it, is it unhealthy if it's a trauma bonding? Is that, does that mean that person is not a yeah. good partner? I think if someone is not treating you well and you are more attracted to them, that is a definite sign of trauma bonding. It's also not healthy. Uh, you know, a lot of people, there's a roller coaster feeling, you know, people like sometimes want what they can't have. It becomes, you know, as again, it's the seeking of validation from someone else. When someone takes that away, we become addicted to trying to get it back. And then when we get it back for a little bit, it feels really good. It feels like a high again. And then it comes crashing down when the person withdraws that. That's a very unhealthy relationship cycle to be in with these massive highs and lows and constant seeking of validation. Um, and so, but that is definitely, that is an indication of a trauma bonding of constantly trying to seek love and approval from someone who withdraws it, takes it away, is mean to you, pushes you away. Um, and again, that's something to ask yourself. So where is this coming from? What is this, is this coming from my unmet need here? And is it coming from something in childhood? And Again, you, you, those are the questions you would have to ask yourself is what is this, what is this really about? What am I really trying to get healed here from this person? Is that helpful? Very, thank you. Okay. I know that there's a bunch of questions in the chat. Uh, I'll go ahead and read them to you. Um, there's two people with their hand raised, but we'll take a few from the chat, one moment. Okay. So in the chat, I see, how can we avoid to attract 
another traumatized person as a partner. How can we avoid? Yeah, I'm gonna go to, look too. Uh, it, this is the first one I saw. How how can we? How long does it take to heal with an imago therapist? Is one question. I don't know. If okay, we'll do the imago. That's an easy one. Okay. Um, again, there's no timeline, but I will say that with some of my most high conflict couples. I would say it takes about a year and a year and a half. And this is the very high conflict couples where they feel like they don't need to come to therapy that much anymore. And that being said, I've had some really high conflict couples that won't come for two years and then they'll come back again because they'll reach another point of real tension. And it takes much shorter the second time around. Like I'm experiencing this now in my practice is that maybe they need three or four sessions brush up. Um, after they do that initial work. Um, but for other people, it can be, you know, it's ranged from as short as, you know, a month or two to six months where they feel like, okay, we have our relationship on track. Um, but again, there's some, and not every couple also, um, you know, the point of couples therapy isn't necessarily always for people to stay together. It's more so for them to figure out if the relationship has a future together. So not everybody stays together either. But I would say um, the majority of couples that come through, um, it ranges from a couple months to a couple years when they feel like if they stay together, that they feel like they're in a good place and they can go forward. I think, I think you answered the question yep. Corey asked is, do all your cu couples make it? Or who was her word? Oh, okay. So yeah, I think I you answered them, that. I, we don't that always don't, know. She said, do you ever have couples that don't make it? Was her question, sir. Yeah, oh. yeah. Yeah, and you know, sometimes we don't always know, but I would say the majority, um, the majority do make it. But of course, there are those that don't. Um, and it's, a, it's hard work. And in, in order for people to make it, both people have to be invested in making it work and both people have to show up and do the work um, and have accountability to work for themselves. And so that, that's sort of the, uh, the biggest indicator of success to me is when I see both people in the couple working super hard to cross the bridge to empathize with each other and to understand that both perspectives are, are valid and, and those are the couples that I think do the, the best. But some of those couples, again, it will take years and a lot of it is determined um, on how early the wounding occurred. So we say, you know, if the developmental trauma or the early wounding, the earlier it occurred, and a lot of the times this is gonna connect to the next question. Um, some couple, most couples are attracted to each other sort of at the same place in the developmental wounding. And so sometimes the, the earlier it occurs, the longer it is. Um, so it, de it depends too on the childhood wounding, how long um, it takes. Uh, then I know, sorry, there was a question about, uh, yes, I'm seeing one, Ingrid, it's EMDR, EMDR therapy. Uh, about the, how can we avoid to attract another traumatized person as a partner? Um, that's, again, you know, I think doing the self work first, at least the, the process of doing that, if you're single, the book Keeping the Love You Find by Harville Hendricks is a really good book. It has exercises and things. Um, there's another book that's kind of interesting called Calling in the One, which is the best way of doing these exercises that help you become aware of yourself so that you're not being more attracted to, you know, people who, who have a lot of work to do. Uh, but you can sort of see, you know, from how people react and respond to conflict can give you clues as you're dating someone in the beginning, like how do they communicate? Do they run away from conflict? You know, you can sort of see patterns. Um, you can look at your old patterns and relationships as well and look at what type of people was I drawn to. Um, how did they treat me? And, you know, how did they communicate? How did they respond in times of conflict? And, you know, and really paying attention to that when you're dating someone as things come up. Um, you know, it's, uh, sometimes it takes time to get to know people, unfortunately, and we're not always going to know um, right away if somebody is a good fit. Um, 
or how they respond to conflict. What is interesting though in the media, I've been seeing a lot of stories about these celebrities lately that have gone into these sort of whirlwind relationships. And, and we talked about this in my, my narcissist talk, is that one blanket piece of advice I'd give is don't jump into anything too quickly and something that is really romantic and over the top at the beginning is something that should give you pause. Um, taking your time to get to know someone, being cautious um, you know, in your relationships and, and getting to know someone over time because that's how somebody uh, will prove themselves to you is how, you know, how they show up in conflict, how they communicate. And you know what, if they're not, if they're a work in progress too, if they're committed to building themselves and working on themselves and working on the relationship with you, then I think that's great too. I think there's definitely two wounded people who can be together, but if they're both committed to working on themselves and, you know, even going to a couple's therapist, I'm all for it. Uh, again, I don't think you have to be this totally healed person to be in a loving relationship, but I think you have to be committed to doing the work and you have to find someone who's committed to doing the work and committed to self-growth. So, okay. Okay, but I think we'll take one final. Well, actually, maybe you answered this was, you pretty much answered this question. What some important questions, considerations one can ask themselves and future potential partners that you are attracting a good partner. I think you answered that, would you say? Yeah, um, I would say um, a, a lot of the things that I just talked about is, you know, asking yourself, you know, what, how is this person dealing with things when hard things come up? You know, how are they communicating? Uh, if if someone's very critical of you and mean to you and you feel like you're walking on eggshells, again, that goes back to our narcissism talk a bit, but you want to avoid that like the plague. Um, you know, and again, if somebody does have flaws, but they're really committed to working on them and you see them working on that and you see them progressing, um, that's a that's a good sign as well. So I just think looking at, you know, how people treat you, how they make you feel. Uh, again, your gut feelings about somebody, our intuitions are our best guide. We all have it. I'm going to also put The Gift of Fear by Gavin De Becker. I'm going to put this in the chat because this is a great book about our gut instincts and getting in touch with our gut instincts and how we assess people in our lives. Uh, so I think those are some of the ways, and I'll just keep repeating myself being aware of our stuff that we're bringing into the relationship and our unmet needs and our childhood wounds. Um, the more aware we are of ourselves and what we're bringing in, the more we're gonna attract people who are as committed to growth as we are. Okay, well, thanks. Thank you for that. Uh, Stuart has his hand raised. Stuart, would you like to ask a question? Hi, everybody. Um... Wow. Um, Lena, thanks a lot for all this, uh, for the narcissist talk as well. I went out and read your book and it was amazing. Um, Thank you. Uh, I also picked up one of the recommendations, which was the, um, the one on passive aggressive covert narcissist by Debbie Mirza. Mm -hmm. I read that, I read that book and that was my marriage. Uh, yeah. I couldn't put my finger on it. Mm -hmm. Then I look back at, all of the relationships I've had in my life and all four of them were, I chose abused women. Uh, and I found myself wanting more intimacy out of um, all these relationships. And through my work, through all this stuff, last week it hit me that I didn't get the intimacy that I needed from my parents. Uh -huh. What I want to know is how does knowing that help? because I, sometimes I get so involved in this self-help journey that it just makes me, it just drags me down. I know. know. And I forget that I forget the joy in life, you know? Yeah. Yeah. You know, and I mean, I think that's the, the double edged sword of growth work, you know, is that we don't want to become too bogged down in it where we get to that point where it's just every, it's just shaping everything in our life, right? We want to have joy again. I think some parts of denial are really good in our mental health journey. Like we don't have to be committed to growth all the time yeah. and we should 
we should be able to compartmentalize and deny um, and just live, you know, sometimes just have moments of life where we're just frivolous and joyful. Um, and in fact, I tell a lot of the couples that I work with, if they can commit to this, I say, you know what? We are committed to one hour a week together to talk about your relationship. The rest of the week, I want you to have fun and enjoy each other. Mm. Think about this one hour a week as your time for growth and your time and your work together and the rest don't think about it, right? Because if you thought about your relationship all the time, that would be really heavy and unhealthy, right? Exactly. So, um, so I actually would give the same advice to you is that you can set aside some time for, you know, for your time to reflect and to work on that. And then you can mm. compartmentalize it and live your life the rest of the time. I think as long as we're just paying attention to it and dealing with it on some level, I think that's totally, and I think that's actually healthy. Yeah. Uh, I do think when we're talking about this aha moment of, oh, okay, I'm attracted to uh, somebody because I didn't get that from my parents. Um, that's just the very beginning, you know, just the mm. awareness in itself it shapes how we can pick our future partners. You know, in my own journey, once I became aware of the subconscious and what it was seeking, I was able to make much healthier choices mm -hmm. in my relationships because uh, I finally understood, you know, like, ah, I'm seeking something that I didn't get from these really unhealthy people. And I want to put a stop to that. I mean, it's been, it's been, a, it was a 25 year marriage and I'm out of it for about five years and I'm terrified to pick a new partner. I don't of let course. any, I don't let anybody in past friendship and I've got a lot of friends, you know, yeah. me mm -hmm. telling a woman that I'm interested in her, you can forget about it because yeah. I'm still in that, you know, that hurt yeah. and pain. Yeah. Well, remember what I said in the beginning that the three hardest things in life are death, divorce, and moving with divorce being the hardest of the three. Divorce is a huge trauma and you're looking at a 25 year marriage. That's a huge chunk of your life. You know, uh, the first divorce was easy. The second one was yeah. hard. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, you know, you just, we also have to be really patient and kind with ourselves and take it one day at a time, you know? Um, and one day, you may wake up and you may be ready again, but you know, mm. just be patient and kind to yourself. Okay. Thank you. It's a lot. It's a lot you're dealing with. Okay. Nadia. So there are no hands raised at the moment. Oh, okay. Zenny's raised her hand. Go ahead. Zenny. Uh, do you want to unmute your name? Um, is it Xeni? Zeni? I'm not sure how you pronounce your name. X E N I E. Would you like to? Go ahead. Yeah, thank you. Um, in my personal story, I went through a uh, big trauma since I was very, very child. Then I, through my life, I experienced a lot of abuse from family members and my mother not being able to manage her loss. Um, mm -hmm. So I've been realizing how much I bring this trauma to my relationships. And lately I discovered that um, sometimes when I lose my coolness, <laughs> um, I come back to that state of childhood and I became a child to my partner. Uh -huh. And it was very painful to realize that I was asking, from my partner, the attention and the love that in my mind I didn't receive from my my mother in this case. Uh -huh. um, be, being able to realize that was very painful for me and <laughs> felt ashamed with him. Uh -huh. But at the same time, like he was so loving and he was so uh, confident that I could heal it by myself. That really helped me to go through and move forward. But some other times that I'm not aware, that I'm not conscious enough to realize that this, this is coming from the past or from my childhood. How can I <laughs> um, gain this awareness when I am coming up to claim to him something that doesn't belong to him? Mm -hmm. So are you, um, have you worked with a therapist before? I have, yeah. So, yeah. since I was okay. a lot of work. Yeah, yeah. So you're, you're used to the therapy, yeah. So, mm -hmm. um, 
Okay, so just give me your question one more time, just like in a, a one sentence. Yeah, how, how can I speed up the awareness? Speed up the awareness, okay. The yeah. awareness, yes, that what I'm asking from my partner is mm -hmm. something from mine and from, it's related to my past story and not it's, it doesn't have anything mean to be with him. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So you want to speed up. So this is a partner you're currently with right now. Yes. Okay. Yes. And you want to speed up the awareness. Yeah. 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 I know. I know that when we're sitting in pain, when we're sitting in pain and something is really painful, all we want to do is speed through it. Right. I mean, right. that makes total sense that we just want to leave it behind, you know? And again, you know, to the gentleman I spoke to before you, I wish we could speed it up. Um, but I think, just the every day, you know, that you can tell yourself if you have to repeat it to yourself over and over again. This is coming from what I didn't get from my mother. You know, just to have that mantra to continue to tell yourself that um, I think is really helpful. You know, just again, someone mentioned CBT, cognitive behavioral therapy, which is something that I'm also uh, really a big fan of. And I also think there's a lot of really exciting studies now about trauma and the brain. And we can make new neural pathways and it create new experiences and new messages. And a lot of that is actually just repeated, repeated behavioral mm -hmm. mantras or whatever, where we're creating these new pathways and we're starting to replace the old messages with the new ones. So I think if there are, and someone had mentioned affirmations earlier, just, you know, affirmations, if you could write down affirmations about yourself and that message that you really want to believe and to internalize is to repeat it all the time. Mm -hmm. And again, to be so, be kind and patient to yourself because what, what you went through was horrible, you know, and mm -hmm. it takes a long time to build those new pathways to replace the old messages and the old beliefs with the new ones. Mm -hmm. And so just, I think, you know, one, we, we, we want to speed up, but we also, the, sometimes the more we want to get somewhere, the more it's going to feel painful because we're, we want to get somewhere too fast, you know? So mm -hmm. if we can also learn to be present and being okay with where we are now, but again, continuing to create the repeated phrases or affirmations that you want to believe and to continue to repeat them and remind yourself I do think one day you'll wake up and you'll feel better. You know, again, we're never going to be fully healed, right? None of us will, but I think you'll, I think one day if you continue to do that and continue to be kind to yourself, that you'll, yeah. you'll slow, slowly you start to see, hmm, I'm better than I was two weeks ago. I'm better than I was one year ago because mm -hmm. I see it happen all the time in therapy, mm -hmm. but everybody's really impatient with mm -hmm. the process. I actually have a story I always tell people. I had a client and she had come to me with severe anxiety and panic attacks and she was, you know, perfectionist. And she had she worked really hard and we were working together for 6 months and she was getting a lot better. She didn't have any panic attacks anymore. And she came in one day 6 months later and she was really upset and I could tell and I said, "Why are why do you look, you know, so upset today?" And she said, well, it's been six months. I thought I would be cured by now. Like she thought she was going to get rid of all her anxiety and she was going to be a hundred percent. And I said to her, well, you're never going to be cured of your anxiety, you know, because anxiety is a uh, part of the human experience and we have it for a reason. And we have anxiety to alert us about danger or to motivate us. You know, there's a purpose for all of it. And the key to life is not getting rid of something, but again, it's learning how to live with it. So it doesn't in a, in a way where we see it working to our advantage instead of our disadvantage. So again, the reframe here is one day, what happened to you, you can use to your advantage. You know, it made, I, I love, um, I think people, you know, who have had these childhood traumas are the most inspiring people. I love to, you know, to work with them and be around them because they're beautiful people, you know, and, and they learn how to live these really, oops, sorry, my phone fell again, these really amazing, you know, they learn that they're, they integrate their trauma as part of them. 
and they are very empathetic people and they use it, you know, for good in the world. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Whereas some people who, you know, never had any wounding or hurt or given everything completely spoiled, mm -hmm. the littlest things shake them, you know, they can't deal with the littlest things in life. Yeah. And so I think, you know, you're, you're probably a lot stronger than you even give yourself credit for. Yeah, but to your point, like, yes, and I don't want more trauma in my life. Mm -hmm. and, and I don't want to recreate any trauma either or drama. You right. Know? So, yeah. My, my thought of wanting to speed this because I don't want to stay longer there. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I want to feel it, you know, and move on. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, again, I would just really work on, again, this is, there's no easy answers at all for this kind of thing, but again, the um, con continuing to tell yourself every day, like, this is not, this is not my partner, this is, you know, read the book, Getting the Love You Want by Harville Hendricks. Okay. Um, <laughs> if you like it, read it over and over and over again, continue to repeat these messages. Okay. And then, you know, the affirmations that if you're... <laughs> I, you know, again, I don't know what your um, fears are, but if your fear is like, I'm unlovable, you know, all those things, the affirmations you would tell yourself is I am lovable, you know, and you tell it to yourself until you believe it, you know, it's the repeat, repeat, repeat. So that's my very basic answer. But again, these are really t hard things. <clears throat> I wish you. I had a magic wand. That's what I always say. Right? <laughs> I do. <laughs> yeah. I'd be very, very wealthy if I had that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> For your question. Thank yeah. you. Good luck to you. So, um, Jaya has her hand has raised. Jaya, do you want to ask a question? Yeah, sure. Thank you. Um, Thank you, Leanne, for the presentation. I really enjoyed listening to you. Um, I'm just actually really curious about one of the answers, um, your responses to one of the questions that was asked earlier. Um, mm -hmm. This was about um, how to avoid people who've been through trauma. Mm -hmm. um, you mentioned something about how they deal with conflict um, mm -hmm. and how, how they respond to it. Yes. Could you, could you please elaborate on that a little bit? Like what exactly that they do that would want you? Of course. Yeah. That's, um, and I talked about this. I'm going to go over a little bit because I, I also realize a lot of people probably weren't at my first webinar I did with Nadia, where it was more about avoiding kind of toxic people and tactics toxic people use. Um, there's a couple things that I think, you know, we look at, and again, are, are these people committed to growth and changing that? Because we all do some of these things when we're in reptilian brain. And so again, um, it's not just about are people doing these things, but it's also, are they apologizing? Are they aware? Are they committed to not doing it as much anymore? Uh, John Gottman is a famous couples therapist, and he talked about the four horsemen of the apocalypse and relationships. Um, and so these are four things that he studied that um, couples who have a high rate of divorce do. And so, I mean, it all, it all seems very basic, like the couples who stay together are kind to each other, right? That's really, I mean, that's not brain science for anybody to hear that. But the four things that uh, couples do that really drive, you know, disconnection, uh, one is criticism. And um, so if somebody in conflict says horrible things to you, not, you know, may, they may not even just be cursing at you, but say things that make you feel bad about yourself. You're a loser, you know, things like that. That to me is something that's pretty unacceptable. Um, so in conflict, if it's, you know, resorting to name calling and criticism, the other one Gottman talks about is contempt. Do you, when you're with someone, do you feel like they despise you? Are they rolling their eyes um, when you're expressing a concern to them? Are they, you know, crossing their arms or is their body language? Do you feel, um, do you feel this contempt from them? That's another one. Um, defensiveness. So that is something that's linked with something called gaslighting, where you approach somebody and you say, you know, I felt really hurt when you did that. 
Defensiveness, they would just throw it right back to you and say, well, if you didn't treat me in such a way, I wouldn't treat you that way. Or I only did that because you did this, you know? So that's also something called blame shifting where you approach somebody with a concern and they turn the blame around on you and don't address um, the hurt that they caused you. And so that's a form of defensiveness. It's a form of blame shifting. It's a form of gaslighting, which is um, when you approach someone with a concern, they say, oh, you're, just, you're just too sensitive. Oh, that was just a joke. You're crazy. You know, so they make you guess, second guess your experience about your feelings. And then the final um, one is called stonewalling. And that is just what I also refer to as shutting down. So, you know, you go to someone, you want to talk about conflict. Um, we don't have to talk about conflict in the moment when we're in reptilian brain, but it's really important that we don't brush really big things under the rug. So stonewalling is just not engaging with someone and shutting them out, ignoring them, the silent treatment. Um, so those are some things that happen in conflict that if these are repetitive patterns and the person is not committed to coming back and resolving these or working on the things that they're doing that are hurting you, that's a big sign that, you know, if the person is not committed to growing and um, stopping these things, because, you know, in a healthy relationship, we should really try to avoid all of those things in general. And when we can't avoid all of those things, we should be actively trying to repair and re-engaging um, in a kind way after the conflict. But again, this is, a lot of this stuff comes for people after doing lots of Imago work because a lot of people are coming into this work very unconscious, traumatized, doing things that their parents did or things that were modeled for them. So again, you know, we're all humans and, um, and a lot of the time it's just, we have to learn. Nobody teaches us how to be in relationships. So, you know, we have to learn this stuff. Um, but if we learn it and we're committed again to, trying to stop some of it, I think then that's a good, a really good sign in a human being. Um, I did uh, want to just uh, quickly address and that someone had asked about, and, and I'm sorry, I'm, I can't um, keep up with the entire chat, but sometimes I'll see something. Is CBD, CBD helpful for trauma? Are we talking about CBT or CBD, like cannabis oil, to the person who asked that question? CBD. I don't know about that. I don't know if there's evidence-based studies on that, but um, people use CBD for anxiety and it helps a lot. So I think anxiety and trauma are very linked. So there could be some benefits, but I don't know. Um, I don't know if there's been studies done related to trauma. Okay. Uh, Corey has her hand raised. Corey, would you like to ask a question? Yes, thank you. First of all, thank you so much. I found it really, really interesting. And um, yeah, just thank you so much. The, the one that I wanted to, the question I wanted to address to you, and I, I have an opinion about this, but do you think that sometimes couples reach a point of no return or where their paradigms are so different mm -hmm. that that one person in the relationship can recognize actually this isn't going to work and this can this can come i'm talking about myself obviously mm -hmm. so i think this can come after years of really doing a lot of self reflecting soul searching mm -hmm. and illusion in a dynamic that was not healthy to begin with yeah and then it becomes too late to shift mm -hmm. the dynamic because it yep. becomes so embedded. Yeah, a hundred percent. I think that happens quite a bit. And like I said earlier in this talk, I view couples therapy not as a way that everybody stays together, but yep. for the people to figure out if they need to move on or not. Because yep. I do not, I think that, you know, I have worked with couples and, you know, there was one couple I saw relatively recently. I was like their third or fourth couples therapist. And, you know, they ended up divorcing and they said, you know, I think they tried to make me feel better. They're like, it's not you. We wish we had come to you 10 years earlier. And um, it just, by the time they came to me, that it, they were embedded in such a healthy dynamic. It was just too much resentment and hostility 
and they just weren't, um, it was just too much trauma had developed within the relationship. And so the best decision in their, their, uh, life was to divorce. And I think that that's, I think that happens quite a bit. But as a corollary to that, if you come into a relationship not self-actualized enough in the first place and you're going in because you want, you know, the, the sort yeah. of uh, prince on a white horse syndrome mm -hmm. that someone's going to come and rescue you and look after you and all that kind of stuff, yeah. which is fine for some people. I'm sure that's fine. But mm -hmm. for others, it's really... Uh, it's something that you can think you want and then you realize actually yeah. you don't want that at all. Yeah. And I think sometimes people get into trouble when, um, they're, again, they're seeking, they don't they, for example, they don't want to be alone and that's the driving yeah. force behind seeking a relationship. Yeah. That's sometimes how we can become attracted to toxic people. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, when we're driven by fear you know, like fear of being alone or those kind of things. Cause sometimes we, we can overlook things because of our desperate need to be loved, you know? And so that piece about self-actualization is very important of trying to approach a relationship where, you know, I'm willing to walk away from this if this is unhealthy for me, because even if I'm terrified of being alone, I think that's, you know, that's when you're in a, a good place of discernment. But also it may not even be that the other person is toxic because that's not necessarily the case. It may just right. be that it's bad. It's, it's, a, it's just not an appropriate choice in terms yeah. of your vision for your Exactly. Future. Exactly. Yeah. Sometimes it's just not a good match either. Does, yeah, and it, it doesn't have to do with either person being bad. You know, it's just not, yeah, it's just not a good, as one of my friends used to like to say, some people like apples and some people like oranges. Doesn't mean... An apple's better than an orange, you know? It's just, it's just not a match. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you for your questions. Um, so we, we, don't, we don't have any hands raised, but would anyone like to ask a question? Uh, would anyone like to just go ahead and ask a question right now? Yes, if it's possible. Sure. Yeah, um, I, I, I answered your question, Lena, about uh, what am I looking, uh, what, what do I want to heal when I'm looking for someone? And I think it's, uh, it's a lack of tenderness. It's, uh, I, I was, when I was a child, I was, uh, when I was a baby, I was isolated from my parents and, I, and, and I, for three weeks, I think I didn't have any, any physical uh, contact with them. Mm -hmm. So uh, this is what I'm looking for. But my question is, uh, now that I know that, mm -hmm. and, I, and I'm attracted to a guy who doesn't give that, that's mm -hmm. what I would say. What shall I do? I mean, shall I um, heal it for myself and, and keep on with this guy saying it's, it's, it's not his fault? I mean, it's just in, inside me? Or shall I choose very tender guys? I mean, there's a lot to unpack here. Um, one, I would say definitely read Getting the Love You Want by Harville Hendricks because it's going to go into this way more in depth than I did today. So I think that's going to be helpful. Um, you know, I think, again, there's these very personal decisions is, you know, am, can I be happy without that tenderness? Is everything else in the relationship good? You know, um, you know, there's part of that acceptance as well is like, well, maybe I don't need that tender or maybe I can accept this about him. Everything else is great. You know, so that is one way to look at it. Um, you know, and I always say people have very different needs and it's not for me to tell people what is important to them because somebody also might say, you know what, I really need that tenderness and I, I need it and I need that in a relationship and somebody else might go and try, try to find someone who can give that to them. That's a very, very personal decision that you, you know, you can, um, you can explore is that, do I really need that? Um, the other thing is, is if you guys were a couple in my office and we were exploring that, one of the things that I would have your partner do is um, stretch we call it a stretch, which is being tender is not his comfort zone. And we say in Imago, our partner wants to do the things that make us happy. If it were easy for them, they'd already be doing it. 
So there's something about your partner that's hard for him to be tender. Maybe he didn't get that as a child. You know, I don't know, but it's not intuitive for him. That's not his intuitive self to be tender. But we also say in Imago, my partner's unmet needs are the blueprint for my own growth, which means we encourage people to stretch outside their comfort zone to meet their partner's needs, or at least in little ways. And so if he was in my office, I would, you know, um, see if he could do something that wasn't such a huge stretch for him, but that could help meet that need of you needing that tenderness. And maybe that would be holding your hand um, while watching a movie, you know, something like that, we would give him actionable steps where, or to send you a sweet text message. You know, a lot of my couples, for example, if they really want those verbal affirmations from their partner and their partner is not a verbal affirmation person. And this also comes from the five love languages, which is another pretty good book that a lot of people know about. But, you know, I would say, okay, well, you know, he's never going to be this gushy, like over the top emotional person, but, um, you know, he will, uh, we can have him send you an appreciation every morning. And even when we might start with, thank you for making me dinner last night, you know, so we, we work with people. Um, and so we can also ask our partner for those things as well, you know, um, and it doesn't have to, you, it's not like we're changing you. I'm not asking you to become a different person. And sometimes that's um, complimenting their behavior when they do something that feels tender to you. So that's, I really loved it when you held my hand the other day. Could you do more of that, please? You know, so that those are ways to ask for more of what we need. Um, and Nadia, I do have to go in five minutes because I need to get my kids on their Zoom calls at 2.45. Nadia, I think we lost her. No, Nadia, you're right. muted. You're muted. Nadia, oh, sorry, muted. Lina. Lina, I'm so sorry. I was talking, yeah. talking. I thought you could hear me. I was muted. I was going to say, then we'll bid you goodbye if you need to go. There's no more questions. And okay. uh, and I was going to say thank you so much. Uh, thank you so much for the session. And yeah. I hope that perhaps you could come back again. We'll talk about that later. Yeah, um, I also just wanted to say there was an EMDR therapist in the chat. I'm on my phone. I can't respond to her. But um, SMH, if you want to get my email from Nadia, please um, do that. Because there was a therapist in the chat who wanted to connect. And sure. thanks, everybody. Thank you all for being here and for your questions and for your vulnerability. Thank you, Dina. OK. Well, goodbye, everybody. Goodbye, everybody. Thank, Thank you, you very much. And uh, hopefully we'll see Lena again. And tomorrow it's about positivity. So if you want to learn how to be more positive, join us tomorrow. Alexandra Pearson will be our speaker. Good night. Good night. Good night. Bye. Thank you, everybody. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you.